This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. Chapter 16. First Pipes. I've Lost My Knife. After dinner all the gang turned out to hunt for turtle eggs on the bar. They went about poking sticks into the sand, and when they found a soft place they went down on their knees and dug with their hands. Sometimes they would take fifty or sixty eggs out of one hole. They were perfectly round white things, a trifle smaller than an English walnut. They had a famous fried egg feast that night, and another on Friday morning. After breakfast they went whooping and prancing out on the bar, and chased each other round and round, shedding clothes as they went, until they were naked, and then continued the frolic far away up the shoal water of the bar, against the stiff current, which latter tripped their legs from under them from time to time, and greatly increased the fun. And now and then they stooped in a group and splashed water in each other's faces with their palms, gradually approaching each other with averted faces to avoid the strangling sprays and finally gripping and struggling till the best man ducked his neighbor, and then they all went under in a tangle of white legs and arms, and came up blowing, sputtering, laughing, and gasping for breath at one and the same time. When they were well exhausted, they would run out and sprawl on the dry, hot sand, and lie there and cover themselves up with it, and by and by break from the water again and go through the original performance once more. Finally it occurred to them that their naked skin represented flesh-colored tights very fairly, so they drew a ring in the sand and had a circus, with three clowns in it, for none would yield this proudest post to his neighbor. Next they got their marbles and played knucks and ring-taw and keeps, till that amusement grew stale. Then Joe and Huck had another swim, but Tom would not venture, because he found that in kicking off his trousers he had kicked his string of rattlesnake rattles off his ankle, and he wondered how he had escaped cramps so long without the protection of this mysterious charm. He did not venture again until he had found it, and by that time the other boys were tired and ready to rest. They gradually wandered apart, and dropped into the dumps, and fell to gazing longingly across the wide river to where the village lay drowsing in the sun. Tom found himself writing Becky in the sand with his big toe. He scratched it out and was angry with himself for his weakness. But he wrote it again, nevertheless. He could not help it. He erased it once more, and then took himself out of temptation by driving the other boys together and joining them. But Joe's spirits had gone down almost beyond resurrection. He was so homesick that he could hardly endure the misery of it. The tears lay very near the surface. Huck was melancholy, too. Tom was downhearted, but tried hard not to show it. He had a secret, which he was not ready to tell yet, but if this mutinous depression was not broken up soon, he would have to bring it out. He said, with a great show of cheerfulness, "'I bet there's been pirates on this island before, boys. We'll explore it again. They've hid treasures here somewhere. How'd you feel to light on a rotten chest full of gold and silver, hey?' but it roused only a faint enthusiasm, which faded out with no reply. Tom tried one or two other seductions, but they failed, too. It was discouraging work. Joe sat poking up the sand with a stick and looking very gloomy. Finally he said, "'Oh, boys, let's give it up. I want to go home. It's so lonesome.' "'Oh, no, Joe, you'll feel better by and by,' said Tom. "'Just think of the fishing that's here. I don't care for fishing. I want to go home.' "'But, Joe, there ain't such another swimming place anywhere. "'Swimming's no good. I don't seem to care for it, "'somehow, when there ain't anybody to say I shan't go in. "'I mean to go home. "'Oh, shucks! Baby! You want to see your mother, I reckon. "'Yes, I do want to see my mother. "'And you would, too, if you had one. "'I ain't any more baby than you are.' And "'Joe snuffled a little. "'Well, we'll let the crybaby go home to his mother, won't we, Huck? "'Poor thing!' Does it want to see its mother? And so it shall. You like it here, don't you, Huck? We'll stay, won't we?" Huck said, "'Yes,' without any heart in it. "'I'll never speak to you again as long as I live,' said Joe, rising. "'There, now!' And he moved moodily away and began to dress himself. "'Who cares?' said Tom. "'Nobody wants you to. Go long home and get laughed at. Oh, you're a nice pirate. Huck and me ain't crybabies. We'll stay, won't we, Huck?' 
Let him go if he wants to. I reckon we can get along without him, perhaps." But Tom was uneasy, nevertheless, and was alarmed to see Joe go sullenly on with his dressing. And then it was discomforting to see Huck eyeing Joe's preparations so wistfully, and keeping up such an ominous silence. Presently, without a parting word, Joe began to wade off toward the Illinois shore. Tom's heart began to sink. He glanced at Huck. Huck could not bear the look, and dropped his eyes, and then he said, "'I want to go, too, Tom. It was getting so lonesome anyway, and now it'll be worse. Let's us go, too, Tom.' "'I won't. You can all go if you want to. I mean to stay.' "'Tom, I'd better go.' "'Well, go along. Who's hindering you?' Huck began to pick up his scattered clothes, and he said, "'Tom, I wish you'd come, too. Now you think it over. We'll, we'll wait for you when we get to the shore.' Well, you'll wait a blame long time, that's all." Huck started sorrowfully away, and Tom stood looking after him, with a strong desire tugging at his heart to yield his pride and go along, too. He hoped the boys would stop, but they still waited slowly on. It suddenly dawned on Tom that it was become very lonely and still. He made one final struggle with his pride, and then darted after his comrades, yelling, "'Wait! Wait! I want to tell you something!' They presently stopped and turned around. When he got to where they were, he began unfolding his secret, and they listened moodily, till at last they saw the point he was driving at. And then they set up a war-whoop of applause, and said it was splendid, and said if he had told them at first, they wouldn't have started away. He made a plausible excuse, but his real reason had been the fear that not even the secret would keep them with him any very great length of time, and so he had meant to hold it in reserve as a last seduction. The lads came gaily back and went at their sports again with a will, chattering all the time about Tom's stupendous plan and admiring the genius of it. After a dainty egg and fish dinner, Tom said he wanted to learn to smoke now. Joe caught at the idea and said he would like to try, too. So Huck made pipes and filled them. These novices had never smoked anything before but cigars made of grapevine, and they bit the tongue and were not considered manly anyway. Now they stretched themselves out on their elbows and began to puff, charily, and with slender confidence. The smoke had an unpleasant taste, and they gagged a little, but Tom said, "'Why, it's just as easy. If I'd have known this was all, I'd have learned long ago.' "'So would I,' said Joe. "'It's just nothing. Why, many a time I've looked at people smoking and thought, well, I wish I could do that, but I never thought I could,' said Tom. "'That's just the way with me, ain't it, Huck?' You've heard me talk just that way, haven't you, Huck? I'll leave it to Huck if I haven't." "'Yes, heaps of times,' said Huck. "'Well, I have, too,' said Tom. Oh, hundreds of times. Once down by the slaughterhouse, don't you remember, Huck? Bob Tanner was there, and Johnny Miller, and Jeff Thatcher, when I said it. Don't you remember, Huck, about me saying that?' "'Yes, that's so,' said Huck. That was the day after I lost a white alley. No, twas the day before." "'There, I told you so,' said Tom. Huck recollects it. I believe I could smoke this pipe all day," said Joe. I don't feel sick. Neither do I," said Tom. I could smoke it all day, but I bet you Jeff Thatcher couldn't. Jeff Thatcher? Why, he'd keel over just with two draws. Just let him try it once. He'd see. I bet he would. And Johnny Miller, I wish I could see Johnny Miller tackle it once. Oh, don't I," said Joe. Why, I bet now Johnny Miller couldn't any more do this than nothing. Just one little snifter would fetch him. Deed it would, Joe. Say, I, I wish the boys could see us now. So do I. Say, boys, don't say anything about it, and sometime when they're around I'll come up to you and say, Joe, got a pipe? I want to smoke. And you'll say, kind of careless-like, as if it weren't anything, you'll say, Yes, I, I got my old pipe, and another one, but my tobacco ain't very good. And I'll say, Oh, that's all right, if it's strong enough. And then you'll out with the pipes, and we'll light up just as calm, and, and then just see him look. By jings, that'll be gay, Tom. I wish it was now. So do I. And when we tell him we learned when we was off pirating, won't they wish they'd been along? Oh, I reckon not. I'll just bet they will. So the talk ran on. But presently it began to flag a trifle and grow disjointed. The silences widened. The expectoration marvelously increased. Every pore inside the boys' cheeks became a spouting fountain. They could scarcely bail out the cellars under their tongues fast enough to prevent an inundation. Little overflowings down their throats occurred in spite of all they could do, and sudden retchings followed every time. 
Both boys were looking very pale and miserable now. Joe's pipe dropped from his nerveless fingers. Tom's followed. Both fountains were going furiously, and both pumps bailing with might and main. Joe said feebly, "'I've lost my knife. I reckon I'd better go and find it.' Tom said with quivering lips and halting utterance, "'I'll help you. You go over that way, and I'll hunt around by the spring. No, you, you needn't come, Huck. We can find it.' So Huck sat down again and waited an hour. Then he found it lonesome and went to find his comrades. They were wide apart in the woods, both very pale, both fast asleep. But something informed him that if they had had any trouble they had got rid of it. They were not talkative at supper that night. They had a humble look, and when Huck prepared his pipe after the meal and was going to prepare theirs, they said, no, they were not feeling very well. Something they ate at dinner had disagreed with them. About midnight Joe awoke and called the boys. There was a brooding oppressiveness in the air that seemed to bode something. The boys huddled themselves together and sought the friendly companionship of the fire, though the dull, dead heat of the breathless atmosphere was stifling. They sat still, intent, and waiting. The solemn hush continued. Beyond the light of the fire everything was swallowed up in the blackness of darkness. Presently there came a quivering glow that vaguely revealed the foliage for a moment, and then vanished. By and by another came, a little stronger, then another. Then a faint moan came sighing through the branches of the forest, and the boys felt a fleeting breath upon their cheeks, and shuddered with a fancy that the spirit of the night had gone by. There was a pause. Now a weird flash turned night into day, and showed every little grass-blade, separate and distinct, and grew about their feet. And it showed three white startled faces, too. A deep peal of thunder went rolling and tumbling down the heavens, and lost itself in sullen rumblings in the distance. A sweep of chilly air passed by, rustling all the leaves and snowing the flaky ashes broadcast about the fire. Another fierce glare lit up the forest, and an instant crash followed that seemed to rend the treetops right over the boys' heads. They clung together in terror in the thick gloom that followed. A few big raindrops fell, pattering upon the leaves. "'Quick, boys, go for the tent!' exclaimed Tom. They sprang away, stumbling over the roots and among vines in the dark, no two plunging in the same direction. A furious blast roared through the trees, making everything sing as it went one blinding flash after another, and the peal on peal of deafening thunder. And now a drenching rain poured down, and the rising hurricane drove it in sheets along the ground. The boys cried out to each other, but the roaring wind and the booming thunder-blast drowned their voices utterly. However, one by one they straggled in at last and took shelter under the tent, cold, scared, and streaming with water. But to have company in misery seemed something to be grateful for. They could not talk, the old sail flapped so furiously, even if the other noises would have allowed them. The tempest rose higher and higher, and presently the sail tore loose from its fastenings and went winging away on the blast. The boys seized each other's hands and fled, with many tumblings and bruises, to the shelter of a great oak tree that stood upon the river bank. Now the battle was at its highest. Under the ceaseless conflagration of lightning that flamed in the skies, everything below stood out in clean-cut and shadowless distinction. The bending trees, the billowy river, white with foam, the driving spray of spume flakes, the dim outlines of the high bluffs on the other side, glimpsed through the drifting cloud-rack and the slanting veil of rain. Every little while some giant tree yielded the fight and fell crashing through the younger growth and the unflagging thunder-peals came now in ear-splitting explosive bursts, keen and sharp and unspeakably appalling. The storm culminated in one matchless effort that seemed likely to tear the island to pieces, burn it up, drown it to the treetops, and blow it away, and deafen every creature in it all at once at the same moment. It was a wild night for homeless young heads to be out in. But at last the battle was done and the forces retired with weaker and weaker threatenings and grumblings, and peace resumed her sway. The boys went back to camp, a good deal awed, but they found there was still something to be thankful for, because the great sycamore, the shelter of their beds, was a ruin now, blasted by the lightnings, and they were not under it when the catastrophe happened. Everything in camp was drenched, the campfire as well for they were but heedless lads, like their generation, and had made no provision against rain. 
Here was matter for dismay, for they were soaked through and chilled. They were eloquent in their distress, but they presently discovered that the fire had eaten so far up under the great log it had been built against, where it curved upward and separated itself from the ground, that a hand-breadth or so of it had escaped wetting. So they patiently wrought, until, with shreds and bark gathered from under sides of sheltered logs, they coaxed the fire to burn again. Then they piled on great dead boughs till they had a roaring furnace, and were glad-hearted once more. They dried their boiled ham and had a feast, and after that they sat by the fire and expanded and glorified their midnight adventure until morning, for there was not a dry spot to sleep on anywhere around. As the sun began to steal in upon the boys, drowsiness came over them, and they went out on the sandbar and lay down to sleep. They got scorched out by and by, and drearily set about getting breakfast. After the meal they felt rusty and stiff-jointed and a little homesick once more. Tom saw the signs, and fell to cheering up the pirates as well as he could. But they cared nothing for marbles or circus or swimming or anything. He reminded them of the imposing secret and raised a ray of cheer. While it lasted he got them interested in a new device. This was to knock off being pirates for a while and be Indians for a change. They were attracted by this idea, so it was not long before they were stripped and striped from head to heel with black mud like so many zebras, all of them chiefs, of course, and then they went tearing through the woods to attack an English settlement. By and by they separated into three hostile tribes, and darted upon each other from ambush with dreadful war-whoops, and killed and scalped each other by thousands. It was a gory day. Consequently it was an extremely satisfactory one. They assembled in camp towards supper-time, hungry and happy. But now a difficulty arose. Hostile Indians could not break the bread of hospitality together without first making peace, and this was a simple impossibility without smoking a pipe of peace. There was no other process that they ever had heard of. Two of the savages almost wished they had remained pirates. However, there was no other way. So, with such show of cheerfulness as they could muster, they called for the pipe, and took their whiff as it passed in due form. And, behold, they were glad they had gone into savagery, for they had gained something. They found that they could now smoke a little without having to go and hunt for a lost knife. They did not get sick enough to be seriously uncomfortable. They were not likely to fool away this high promise for lack of effort. No, they practiced cautiously, after supper with right fair success, and so they spent a jubilant evening. They were prouder and happier in their new acquirement than they would have been in the scalping and skinning of the Six Nations. We will leave them to smoke and chatter and brag, since we have no further use for them at present. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 Pirates at Their Own Funeral but there was no hilarity in the little town that same tranquil Saturday afternoon. The Harpers and Aunt Polly's family were being put into mourning, with great grief and many tears. An unusual quiet possessed the village, although it was ordinarily quiet enough in all conscience. The villagers conducted their concerns with an absent mind and talked little, but they sighed often. The Saturday holiday seemed a burden to the children. They had no heart in their sports and gradually gave them up. In the afternoon Becky Thatcher found herself moping about the deserted schoolhouse yard and feeling very melancholy, but she found nothing there to comfort her. She soliloquized, "'Oh, if I only had a brass and iron knob again! But I haven't got anything now to remember him by!' And she choked back a little sob. Presently she stopped and said to herself, "'It was right here. Oh, if it was to do over again, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say it for the whole world!' But he's gone now. I'll never, never, never see him any more." This thought broke her down, and she wandered away, with the tears rolling down her cheeks. Then quite a group of boys and girls, playmates of Tom's and Joe's, came by, and stood looking over the paling fence, and talking in reverent tones of how Tom did so-and-so the last time they saw him, and how Joe said this and that small trifle, pregnant with awful prophecy, as they could easily see now and each speaker pointed out the exact spot where the lost lad stood at the time, and then added something like, "'And I was a-standing just so, just, just as I am now, and as if you was him, I was as close as that, and, and he smiled just this way, and then something seemed to go all over me, like, 
awful, you know, and, and I never thought what it meant. Of course I but but I can see now. Then there was a dispute about who saw the dead boys last in life, and many claimed that dismal distinction, and offered evidences, more or less tampered with by the witness. And when it was ultimately decided who did see the departed last, and exchanged the last words with them, the lucky parties took upon themselves a sort of sacred importance, and were gaped at and envied by all the rest. One poor chap, who had no other grandeur to offer, said with tolerably manifest pride in the remembrance, "'Well, Tom Sawyer, he licked me once!' But that bid for glory was a failure. Most of the boys could say that, and so that cheapened the distinction too much. The group loitered away, still recalling memories of the lost heroes in awed voices. When the Sunday school hour was finished the next morning, the bell began to toll instead of ringing in the usual way. It was a very still Sabbath, and the mournful sound seemed in keeping with the musing hush that lay upon nature. The villagers began to gather, loitering a moment in the vestibule to converse in whispers about the sad event. But there was no whispering in the house only the funereal rustling of dresses, as the women gathered to their seats, disturbed the silence there. None could remember when the little church had been so full before. There was finally a waiting pause, an expectant dumbness, and then Aunt Polly entered, followed by Sid and Mary, and they by the Harper family, all in deep black, and the whole congregation, the old minister as well, rose reverently and stood, until the mourners were seated in the front pew. There was another communing silence, broken at intervals by muffled sobs, and then the minister spread his hands abroad and prayed. A moving hymn was sung, and the text followed, I am the resurrection and the life. As the service proceeded, the clergyman drew such pictures of the graces, the winning ways, and the rare promise of the lost lads, that every soul there, thinking he recognized these pictures, felt a pang in remembering that he had persistently blinded himself to them always before, and had as persistently seen only faults and flaws in the poor boys. The minister related many a touching incident in the lives of the departed, too, which illustrated their sweet, generous natures, and the people could easily see now how noble and beautiful those episodes were, and remembered with grief that, at the time they occurred, they had seemed rank rascalities well deserving of the cowhide. The congregation became more and more moved as the pathetic tale went on, till at last the whole company broke down and joined the weeping mourners in a chorus of anguished sobs, the preacher himself giving way to his feelings and crying in the pulpit. There was a rustle in the gallery which nobody noticed. A moment later the church door creaked. The minister raised his streaming eyes above his handkerchief and stood transfixed. First one, and another pair of eyes followed the minister's, and then almost with one impulse the congregation rose and stared while the three dead boys came marching up the aisle, Tom in the lead, Joe next, and Huck, a ruin of drooping rags, sneaking sheepishly in the rear. They had been hid in the unused gallery, listening to their own funeral sermon. Aunt Polly, Mary, and the Harpers threw themselves upon their restored ones, smothered them with kisses, and poured out thanksgivings, while poor Huck stood abashed and uncomfortable, not knowing exactly what to do or where to hide from so many unwelcoming eyes. He wavered and started to slink away, but Tom seized him and said, "'Aunt Polly, it ain't fair. Somebody's got to be glad to see Huck.' "'And so they shall. I'm glad to see him, poor motherless thing.' and the loving attentions Aunt Polly lavished upon him were the one thing capable of making him more uncomfortable than he was before. Suddenly the minister shouted at the top of his voice, "'Praise God, from whom all blessings flow! Sing, and put your hearts in it!' And they did. Old Hundred swelled up with a triumphant burst, and while it shook the rafters, Tom Sawyer the pirate looked around upon the envying juveniles about him, and confessed in his heart that this was the proudest moment of his life. As the souled congregation trooped out, they said they would almost be willing to be made ridiculous again to hear Old Hundred sung like that once more. Tom got more cuffs and kisses that day, according to Aunt Polly's varying moods, than he had earned before in a year, and he hardly knew which expressed the most gratefulness to God and affection for himself. 
End of chapter 17